Welcome, and thank you for engaging with Canadian Friends of Peace Now for Bridging the Arab-Jewish Divide. It is part of a continuing series of webinars through which we hope to inform and advocate for understanding, progress, peace, and justice in Israel and Palestine. My name is Brian Rothbard. I'm a member of Peace Now's Board of Directors. We are delighted that Dr. Amal Alsana al Juj will provide her insights for us. We will hear from her in a moment. Joining us is Gabriella Gallagher, the National Chair of Canadian Friends of Peace Now. She will be monitoring and presenting your questions later in the program. Please submit those questions using the Q&A function on your screen. Do not use the chat icon, just the Q&A. If you wish, identify yourself and your location when presenting your questions on the Q&A. For those not familiar with our organization, Gabriella will now provide us with the objectives of Canadian Friends of Peace Now. Gabriella. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Canadian Friends of Peace Now is so honored to have Dr. Elsana al as our guest speaker this evening. I don't want to delay her talk, so I'll be brief. Our organization is partner to Peace Now in Israel, uh, which is also known as Shalom Achshav. Uh, Shalom Achshav is Israel's premier peace movement. Since 1978, Peace Now has promoted a just and viable resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict through the formula of two states for two peoples. Peace Now protests the occupation of Palestinian territory and particularly the expansion of Jewish settlements in the West Bank, which erodes chances for an eventual two-state solution. Here in Canada, we, provoke, we promote the Peace Now message to Canadians and encourage a deeper understanding of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We do this through various means, including webinars like the one tonight. We have a great lineup of webinars for the fall, and I want to highlight one that's coming up on September 29th. Our speaker will be Professor Eli Poday, an expert on Arab-Israel relations, who will talk about the new deals between Israel and the Gulf states and what they mean for Israel-Palestine peace. So, uh, so this is part of what we do. We encourage our, also, we, we encourage our government to take positions that support peace. And very important, we contribute funds to Shalom Shav for their educational programs in Israel. With our help, Peace Now is mentoring young Israeli student leaders who reach out to their peers and speak to them about peace and democracy building. Now we can't do any of that without your help. Every donation, large or small, allows us to keep going. So if you're able, please consider making a gift to Canadian Friends of Peace Now. You can go to our website at www.peacenow.org uh, www peacenowcanada.org and click on the donate button. And you can also find all kinds of information about us there. Or you can send uh, a check to our mail mailing address or simply send an email to info at peacenowcanada.org and we can get back to you by phone. For any donation over $10, we'll send you a tax receipt. And now I'm done. And so, Brian, back to you. Thank you, Gabriella. Dr. Amal Alsana al Aljouj has been an activist since she was a child. Her formative years were spent in Lakia, a Bedouin village near Arad in the Negev, with no electricity or running water. She is the fifth of 13 children. She's the first member of her family to have attended university, graduating from Ben Gurion University in Beersheba. She earned her Master's of Social Work and Doctor of Philosophy degrees from McGill University. 
This July, her postdoctoral research was submitted and accepted by Harvard University. She's been a public activist and community organizer. She was a founder and managing director of the Arab Jewish Center for Equality and Empowerment in Israel for a number of years. Currently, as the executive director of the International Community Action Network, ICANN McGill, an organization dedicated to reducing inequality and pursuing social justice, her goal is to bring together Israelis, Palestinians, Jordanians, and Syrians to study at the McGill School of are a very brief, incomplete portrayal of her many pursuits and accomplishments. The advocacy, one, the advocacy for Arab and gender rights in Israel, and two, the pursuit of greater Arab Jewish equality and cooperation. The recipient of many awards and a featured speaker internationally, Amal was nominated for a Nobel Prize in 2005. I am honored to present Dr. Amal Alsana al Amal. So uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much for this great opportunity to have me here and to speak with you. I have been known uh, Shalom Akshav Peace Now for many, many years since I was 18. I uh, attended the first uh, demonstration in Tel Aviv. As a, as a teenager at that time, and I am really delighted to be uh, with you tonight. Uh, the focus of my talk actually is going to be within uh, Israel, because this is where I uh, spend most of my time advocating for equality, justice, and uh, empowering the marginalized communities in Israel, especially focusing on the uh, Bedouin population of the Negev. But I definitely will link that to my efforts here at McGill University to promote uh, peace and justice among um, uh, countries and people in Palestine, Jordan, and, and Israel, and talk about the main foundations of the work we are doing, and really draw on my own uh, personal experience to talk about uh, the future of uh, peace and two-state solution, and the future of equality in Israel, and the future of joint um, vision for Arabs and Jewish in the state of Israel. So this is gonna be uh, the focus of my uh, talk and I hope that uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, absolutely I will be here to answer. But uh, let me start with the idea of the fact that uh, in Israel there are 21% of the uh, Palestinian Israelis and um, the situation between the um, Jewish majority and the Palestinian minority in Israel is not um, um, is not yet um, uh, the the way we want to see it. Uh, the the gaps between the two communities are still um, huge. There is some progress, but the idea of bringing Arab Jewish together in equal basis this is one of the major challenges facing. Um, uh, Israel today, and especially the Bedouin community inside uh, Israel, where still 80,000 people are living without water and without electricity. So for, for me, development and peace are very linked to each other. And any uh, process of peace that doesn't prov provide any uh, idea or any hope for development, that peace won't last. And this is exactly what when we talk about the situation inside Israel between the Palestinian minority and the Jewish majority, where projects in terms of development are not equally distributed, the budget is not equally distributed to both communities, the gaps are there. There is no uh, future for us to see this joint uh, vision. So for me, it was very clear from the beginning that Jewish and Arabs in Israel are together in it. And if we are not making sure that we uh, bring equality and we work for equal opportunities for the Palestinian minority, we will never be able to bring the two communities together. So since day one, when I started working, promoting equality between the Arab minority and the Jewish majority in Israel, the idea of development and equality were the main uh, keys to promote this partnership. 
So in 2000, I established AJIC, the Arab Jewish Center for Equality, Empowerment, and Cooperation. Some of you know that organization. And as AJIC, it stands for Arab Jewish, as I said, the idea of promoting the Bedouin minority in Israel to get equal rights and cooperate and partnership with the Jewish majority on the basis of equality. This is the mission of AJIC. And the idea of coexistence that was for many, many years the, 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 the key concept of bringing Jewish and Arabs together is not, didn't prove itself because you can't build coexistence between people who are not equal. You absolutely can build partnership. And this is what I started to uh, promote in 2000 through AJIC. How can we bring this cooperation based on the empowerment of the most marginalized communities and bringing them to equality, not only around issues of um, uh, 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 education, but also economic uh, partnership. So I wanna just wanna give one example. Uh, in 2000, uh, we started the program called Gap Year, where we brought together uh, Palestinian Israelis, young, young adults, Jewish young adults to volunteer for one year. We call it a year for my community where the idea behind it is to create a new generation of Jewish Israelis, Palestinian Israelis that they will carry the message of peace and carry the message of partnership. Because what we see is that we are lacking of this joint leadership that will promote a narrative of peace and that would promote the discourse of peace inside Israel. And this group is one of the 16 groups that now is operating in the national level of Israel in different areas that brings Jewish and Arabs together to work in Jewish schools and Arab schools where they can model this kind of partnership in front of the children in both societies and to show that there is an alternative for segregation in Israel. And we still see segregation in Israel, despite of this great project, there is a situation where we see people are, can, in, can live their entire life in Herzliya Bituach, not knowing what's going on in the Lagia village in the Negev, and not knowing what's going on in the uh, Kufr Qasim in the Mushalash area. So the idea of this gap year or a, uh, a year for my community is actually to bring as much as we can uh, young adults from both communities to build the future leadership of Israel that it's joint leadership that built of group of Arabs and Jewish who understand the essence of cooperation, the essence, the essence of working together. The other project that really tackled the issue of uh, how we build this cooperation and how we build this kind of, you know, uh, peace uh, discourse and peace activism in Israel is the school in 2007 when we thought uh, and we believed at that time and still believe that there is no way that we talk about integration between the uh, Palestinian Israeli minority in Israel and between the Jewish Israeli majority without creating joint schools in Israel. There is no way that if I would meet for the first time with a Jewish person only in high, only in university, and universities, that's already very late. So the idea when we established at two, in 2000, that school, 2007, is really to bring the kids from a very early ages to really communicate and get to know each other and understand that uh, having a Jewish neighbor is very normal, having an Arab neighbor is very normal, and their future is really tied together as one people living in one piece of land. And through these uh, programs, I, I get to understand, I get to learn very quickly that only by the doing, by bringing people together, by taking down all these boundaries and barriers between the two groups and knowing each other that we will really end this ignorance because many of our leaders in Israel are using and utilizing and employing politics of fear to make sure that my kids will never meet with the other kid from Omer, that my kids will keep 
the fear and and the 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 misunderstanding of who is our neighbor and for many many years and especially with our the the, the government that the current government that use of that use of politics of fear we see it every day we see incitements we see uh they they the way of the very right-wing government using this to really create the fear among people and separate the Arab minority from the Jewish majority in Israel, and this is how they maintain their power. And the way to counter this narrative is really by building people to people peace process, building projects that bring people together that would create and produce a mass movement made of people, regular people, ordinary people who are living in the villages and the towns and the cities that they will believe that peace is in their interest. Peace is not something that the politicians are only uh, talking about and understand. Actually, politicians are the least who understand the need of peace, the least who care about peace. But because we, we leave peace as an as a, as a, as a action and also as a concept in the hands of the politicians, many people feel like this is not our responsibility to act. This is not our responsibility to, to demand and, and, and advocate for peace. And it really remain in the, the, the hands of the, of the politicians. And this is very important. And this is also show, showing us through the years how the work of Peace Now, Shalom Akshab, is, have been uh, going and what are the accomplishments of Peace Now uh, so far. I am not saying that um, this is, I'm, in fact, we are living in a very dark moment when, it, when we are talking about peace. And we have to admit that. We have to admit that it's not the best times for us. We, had, we have to admit that the voice of the right wing, the voice of the people who are not in favor of peace are louder than our voice. The camp who support, uh, um, um, separation is louder than our voice. And this is one of the really challenges that we have to uh, overcome as the peace camp, as people who believe in the peace between internally between Jewish and Arabs. And when I say internally, I mean that the future of Palestine and Israel is also dependent on the future of our relations inside Israel. The Palestinian minority inside Israel play a very crucial role in promoting peace. The fact that we live inside Israel and we understand the Hebrew language and we understand the language, we are the, the, the life project, a uh, bridge, sorry, that can really bridge the, the gaps and bridge the misunderstanding between the communities. And for many, many years, we were put aside and we were excluded from this process. And this was one of the major mistakes that we really have to learn from it. Why, when we talk about peace, why when we negotiate uh, with Palestinians, the Palestinian minority is not part of this process. The Palestinian minority has no say and excluded from this process where we can be the one really to promote and push forward because in our interest is that our state is not in fight with our people. It's in our interest that we can live proud as citizen in the state of Israel, knowing that our people have their own state and our people have their own future uh, secured. So for, for this, I, I, I believe that my next uh, step or stage in working is really to bring Palestinians from West Bank and Jordanians and Israelis together and not only work in a nation, national level as I used to do, but when I came here to McGill University, I was able really to get the opportunity and to look at the region as region and see what is it that we can do to promote justice and peace. And the way to do it is through the, the, the people themselves. Because if people are not feeling that there is enough bread on the table and there is, there is no school for their children, they will never, never think of peace as something that they want. 
the way to turn and peace into a basic need, it has to come linked with development and justice. If it's not linked with development and justice, people will never have stake on peace. It will be only a word. And this is what we have been doing between Palestinians and Israelis through the program at McGill University where we empower the marginalized communities to come together and say, what is it for us to do as social workers? How to empower the marginalized communities to have a voice and to have a say on their future. When there is a war, these, pe these people are the most victimized and they pay the price. Why, when it's peace, these people are not invited to talk and take an action when it comes to peace? Why they are only victims of war, but they are not leaders of peace? And the idea of the program is how to turn the people that for many, many years used to be treated as victims of wars and conflicts to leaders for peace and justice and equality. And I believe after all these 30 years that I have been doing this work, that we have much in common as Jewish and Arabs than things that differentiate us. We have much in common that can bring us together to work towards things that we both want and we both believe. The idea is how to translate this beliefs and this ideas of that that we share into political power. And this is one of the challenges, how to cross this glass ceiling that here you see all people and you can hear this when you talk with the ordinary people, whether it's in, in Palestine or in Israel, and they would tell you that we are for peace. We wanna see that we both, our children and the, the children of the Jewish community are living in peace. What is it that these ideas are not translated into political power that will push our leaders to take this as their agenda. And what I think that it's happening is that we don't have the right leaders in both sides, in the Palestinian side and in the Israeli side, both are lack of a vision. Actually, I would say in the Palestinian side, we have a leader who is lack of, of a vision, who is uh, someone who is really not able to lead. And then in the Israeli side, we have Bibi Netanyahu, who did everything to drive us away from uh, the two-state solution. The expansion of the settlements, the, uh, the checkpoints, the annexation, all the, every policy that he translated into action drove us away from the two-state solution. And this is very risky because I do believe in two-state solution. I think the only way to resolve the Arab, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is by creating two states, one for Palestinians and one for Israel, Israelis. I am not naive. I am aware of these uh, circumstances that we are living in. I am aware of the the uh, policy of Trump uh, administration. I am aware of the current government we are having, but still, if we want to have sustainable peace, if we wanna see sustainable uh, relationships with Palestinians and Israelis, we have to go through the process of two-state solution. Because Israel, in one state solution, Israel can't, have to, I have to be either Jewish or democratic. And Israel can't be both in one state solution. And I don't think that this will be something that, uh, that Palestinian or Israelis want to have, want to have because even Sari Nusaiba himself said once about the two state solution and one state solution. He said, uh, we need to live the two-state solution, even for five minutes. We have to go through that process. And once people live through this, they might decide one day that they wanna have one state solution. And for me, whatever is acceptable for my people 
and for the two peoples is the right solution. And this is what I really want to make sure that we understand. It's not up to external player to determine what is the solution for the Palestinian Israeli conflict. It's for the people in the ground to determine what is it that they want to have as their final solution and sustainable solution for, for their people to live in peace and to live in uh, 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 respectful relationships. I will stop here and open for questions. I think questions will help me direct my, uh, my talk in a way that people might wanna hear and re eager to, to hear my uh, answers and my insights. Thank you very much. That was really very, very appreciated. Um, yeah, I will turn the questions over to Gabriella in a moment. When the ICANN McGill students return to the Middle East, is it possible for them to engage in positive collaboration across borders? Yes, now I hear your question. So just give me a, a, a one minute to frame your question within the context of the program. So the program brings to McGill University students, um, uh, leaders from uh, Jordan, Palestine, and Israel, from NGOs and from universities. And they come here for two years, where in the first year at McGill University, they study what we call the academic courses that all tailored towards international social work, the role of social workers in promoting peace, and the idea that social workers are also ought to help people and empower people in the, in, among the marginalized communities to have a voice about peace and development. And in their second year, they go back to their home countries and each one will start a project in their own neighborhoods to empower marginalized communities to work ar around issues like refugees, for example, in Jordan, around issues like gender-based violence um, in, in, uh, in Palestine and Israel, around issues of bringing together Jewish and Arab kids around uh, um, joint um, uh, projects. And we, every time, try to bring them together to work cross borders when the political situation is allowing us to do that. Uh, if it's allowing us to do that, we go to Jordan and we bring our fellows all to Jordan because this is the place where they all can meet and we do some activities and some uh, a training together. Last year, I was in Jerusalem to train our uh, fellows and they work together uh, on issues of rights uh, based practice uh, in the unrecognized village together with uh, Kofar Aqab in, uh, in uh, Palestine. And this work was in cooperation between the fellows. So when the political situation is allowing us, we encourage our fellows to work together. When the political situation is not um, uh, permitting, we encourage the fellows to work in their own communities because in the end of the day, their work to promote the equality, promote justice in their own community is enough to make people understand why peace is important why peace is not only about this loose concept. Peace is about development and peace about, is about justice and peace is about them having better life and better future and not paying prices for injustice and for conflicts. Thank you. And I will ask one more and then turn it over to Gabriella. What range of perceptions do you receive when you attempt to work with your peers in the West Bank and Gaza? Well, again, what's the question, what? Uh, what range of perceptions, how are you viewed um, by Palestinians and Gazans when you attempt to work collaboratively with them as an Israeli? Well, um, uh, it's a very good question, uh, Brian. Because for for some of them, um, I some of them would see me as um, as as representative of the Israeli side, and they won't feel comfortable with that. Some of them would see me as representative of the Palestinian side, and they want to cooperate. For me, 
this is a perfect place uh, because to be in between is the place where you can really do the work. And uh, for me, it's very um, helpful to explain to the people that being a Palestinian and also an Israeli at the same time is helping them to understand that we can bridge these two concepts in one way that we are sharing the same place and we care about the same place together and we care about justice and peace. And for them to see me as both is really taking down some of the barriers that, that they have in relation to the Israelis. And I feel many times that my place is serving as a bridge for both because I really can relate and understand the Israeli language, the Jewish language and culture and the fear in the Israeli side and can really bring this message across to my Palestinian uh, people and to explain it in a way that they understand why, why Jewish Israelis thinking the way they are thinking. What is the fear that drive people to think in such a way? And also when I talk with the Jewish uh, um, a group and talk about the fear and the, the feeling of the, the Palestinian who were evacuated in 1948 and being refugees and not having a, a, a sense of a future, it's very uh, compelling and appealing when it comes from someone that holds the two identities in one person that really care about the two communities and can represent both in a, in a, in a I, I hope, in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriella, you, do you have some questions that have come through? Yes, I do. Um, so the first question is one that actually dovetails with one that I was going to ask you. It comes from Lee uh, Rimon, and he asks, would you support a Jewish state? And the way I uh, actually worded it in my mind is, do you have a problem with Israel calling itself a Jewish state? Okay, it's a, another challenging, but a very good question. Um, I believe that Jewish people have the right to have a place and a state where they can live and feel secure and safe. It's very problematic for me as a Palestinian citizen of the state of Israel to live in a place that recognize and define, not recognize, it's not an issue of recognition, it's that define itself as a Jewish state where it can exclude me out of this definition. So who am I in that definition? If the people who care about peace and equality, how would you look at me as one of the 21% of the Palestinian minority in Israel? Where do you place me? I am asking you the question back um, because it's not only about definition, it's also about policies that are generating from this definition. When you look just the last six months at the map of the Negev and see what Bennett uh, have been doing in my own village, Legia, trying to expand the city of Beersheba on the expense of Awajan village, it tells you that this administration, this government is not seeing me as, a, as an equal citizen. They see me as something else that second class citizen because they are driven from the, the idea of this land is a Jewish land. This place is a Jewish place. So if the policies are generating from that definition, then obviously I do have a problem. But if policies are not generating and this definition is only symbolic, then I have no problem to live with that. But for now, policies are generating and um, being put in place based on my identity as Jewish or non-Jewish. And this is something that as an activist for peace and justice, very hard to swallow. Thank you. Um, so another question, and maybe it, 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 it arises a little bit from what you were just speaking about. 
Um, uh, we have a question from Ruben Schulz, and he asks, uh, do Bedouin in unrecognized villages vote? And perhaps you could also uh, explain a little bit to people, what is the, what does it mean, an unrecognized village? Okay, I, I thought uh, this is why I, I, didn't foc I didn't really give more explanation because I thought that you are uh, familiar with the concepts. But in 1968, when Israeli government decided to settle the Bedouin community into seven townships, the idea was that they want to move all the Bedouins living in the east side of Beersheba to uh, one of the seven towns that they um, decided will be for the Bedouin community. People who rejected the plan of moving from their original villages to, this se to one of these seven villages are the unrecognized villages, are people who are living in the unrecognized villages. The concept of unrecognized villages created by us as activists, according to the official documents of Israel, they call them illegal villages because they don't see them in the map when you travel to the Negev and you have the official map of Israel, you can't see any of these uh, villages that 80,000 people are living there without electricity, water, and basic uh, uh, services. These people are citizens of the state of Israel. All of them carry the Israeli ID. All of them has the right to vote. So in terms of political rights, we have the right to vote uh, and people absolutely have the capacity to influence the decision making in, in Israel. But when it comes to their, uh, the, the legal uh, definition of their villages, these villages are not recognized by the state of Israel. Thus, every time there is a, a, a project, a state project, uh, they will remove or they will evacuate this village or that village to settle and to build a new uh, Jewish village. For example, you all heard about Imm al-Hiran. You all heard about uh, Bibi when he apologized for the Abu al-Ghani tribe uh, because of the killing and the murder of, um, of uh, Abu al-Ghani. Um, you know, um, at that time, the whole thing was to evacuate um, this tribe from Umm al-Hiran and to build a Jewish uh, village or a village uh, Jewish settlement uh, there. So all these villages are under a daily threat to be evacuated. And one of the uh, daily practices is house demolition. People can't expand the shack. And if they have two rooms shacks and they are growing, there is no way that they can ex expand. If they expand it by two meters, the government will come and determine that this is under demolition. And there is two ways. Either they will put an order to destroy and they ask people to destroy it. And people, some people will do it themselves. If people are not doing that, they will bring bulldozers usually early in the morning and they will take down that simple shack and they will charge the family for the bulldozers. So it's, it's, it's really um, the reality of the unrecognized villages in the Negev until this uh, moment. And just to say, it's not a matter of budget in Israel. It's not a matter of uh, a mistake. It's a matter of political will. There is no political will in the Israeli government to resolve the Bedouin issue for, uh, for you know, forever because it's only 80,000 people. In 1990, between 1992 and 94, Israel was able to settle more than 1 million uh, uh, Russian immigrants in the Negev. So it's not an issue of money. It's, it's not an issue of budget. It's an issue if the government is seeing us as equal citizens of the state of Israel. If there is a good will to see us as part of the people who contribute or they just look as, at us as an obstacle uh, to try to get rid of. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to a, a slightly different, going back to the question of the two-state solution, but it, it certainly 
it does relate to what you have just been speaking about. Um, this is a question from a, an anon anonymous attendee who wants to ask, how can people who believe in the two-state solution deal with the increasing right-wing attitudes of the Jew of Jewish Israelis? So, um, Yes, what can be Yeah, well this is a, that, yeah, so. this is a 1 million dollar question. Mm -hmm. Because absolutely this is what what we have been going through as organization who wants to see the two state solution. Whether it's uh, Shalom Akhshav or the Peace Camp or the New Israel Fund, all these organization that really believe that this is for the long run, this is the more sustainable solution that will end this con conflict forever uh, are juggling with. And I think uh, one challenge is that we, we are not advocating in a way that we have a deadline, a framework for the two-state solution. We are, we are leaving this to like an open end. And having this as an open end is giving Bibi Netanyahu and the right wing uh, a tool to postpone a tool to expand the settlements. And today, when, when we are looking at the settlements, in the last 53 years, we are going really driving very far away from two-state solution by seeing more settlements built. There are more than 800,000 settlers living in West Bank. Thinking of the two-state solution would really require us to think, what is it that we are going to do with these 800,000 people living in the settlements? And Bibi Netanyahu drove us towards a one-state solution. The only difference is that the dictatorship regime that, that he is putting there, what others would call apartheid regime. It's a one-state solution and, and de facto. Uh, Israel is controlling Area C, Israel controlling military, most of the parts in, in West Bank, and we are very far from the two-state two solution. And if we don't have a strong leadership in the left side of the map, if we are not able to create not only uh, among politicians, but really uh, leverage the power of civil society organization, leverage the power of women movements in Israel and in Palestine, both, we will always be the one that will see the change but won't be able to affect the change. The one that would talk about the change but won't be able to design the change. And for many, many years now, we all are watching what's happening without real ability to influence the, the situation and let put it in the on the table. Uh, we we see our leadership. We see the leadership in the Israeli side. We see the leadership in the Palestinian side. The lack of vision of Abbas. Uh, the 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 lack of uh, ability to sit as a a, a a right discourse and a powerful message in the in the left side of the of the map is 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 really one of the problems because we don't have leaders that are able to convince. We don't have leaders that can mobilize the massive groups of people to follow the message. The right wing is using politics of fear and this is a very su successful uh, um, way to, to, to mobilize people. We, people are motivated by hope or fear. Right now, because there is no hope, the fear is going to win. We need leaders that can create a vision of hope. We need leaders that can really talk the language of hope and the vision of a better future. We don't have these leaders in both sides. OK, thank you for that uh, very interesting uh and comprehensive answer. Uh, um, I have a question that um, moves, uh, uh, broadens the the, um, 
the perspective a little bit or, or shifts it a bit. And I, I think it's an interesting one uh, because you are also known uh, as a strong feminist uh, uh, who works for on women's uh, concerns. Now, this question comes from Frida Foreman, and she says, uh, do you think women's equality issues will be part of the discussion on equality between Arabs and Jews, or, or is it part of the discussion? And well, how does it, how does that uh, work? Yeah, With, it's uh, another good question because um, one of the challenge facing us as a feminist movement is our shifting loyalties. Um, many, many times we get together to work in a common um, uh, and joint efforts toward peace. And when there is any uh, attack or any uh, situation of terror happened, we, both of us, would, you know, uh, leave the stage and go back to our own nationalities and to be recognized and defined by who, are, who we are as Jewish or Palestinian, not by who we are as women and by our uh, desire to promote women's rights. I think the minute that we women understand that it doesn't matter, political struggle will always favor men. Political struggle always will be on the expense of our gender struggle. They always in both sides would tell us, now we have a bigger thing to fight for. Leave your issues afterwards. When we liberate Palestine, we will come talk about violence against women. When we secure Israel, we'll come back and talk about the murder of women by their husbands or the domestic violence we are facing. As long as we give hands to these discourses, we will never be able to build our movement that will be able to fight for women equality as part of the nation equality, as part of the political equality, as part of the structure that work for all people, men and women. Now it's not happening. I see the seeds of women wage peace. I, I am very happy to see that, that the movement is growing, but let's face it. We were able all to come together when we decided that we don't want to talk about occupation and we don't want to call it occupation and we want to say we work together for the both people to find uh, a solution. What is that solution? We don't want them to find the solution where we are only pushing them to find that solution. We want to be part of that solution. We want to tell them what is that solution. So when I hear the voice of some of the women in, in the group, I, I like the fact that the movement is, is big, but the movement is big because we don't want to deal with the elephant in the room. And if we are not dealing with the elephant in the room, the first, the first bigua, the first uh, uh, thing happened will bring us apart and I will go back to my village and you will go back to your kibbutz and we don't have anything in common. Gender struggle is a political struggle. And if we are not able to combine both as one struggle, we always won't find ourselves together in any issue relates to gender equality. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a few questions. Uh, and I'm going to try to put them a, a little bit together here about um, what we can do in Canada. Uh, and there's um, there's a couple of questions um, about whether you're involved at all with the heart to heart youth pro, uh, camp. I don't know if you know about it. Um, uh, and uh, and then there's another question. Um, from Ruth uh, Axelrod Pinto about what we can do here in Canada to pr promote um, uh, Dum Kium. Uh, I'm not myself familiar with that, 
uh, but is there room for creating a relationship uh, in the diaspora? In any case, a number of these questions are asking what, how we uh, in Canada can support uh, your efforts. Absolutely, I, I think um, I think in Canada there is a lot of work that has been done to promote uh, projects in the ground. That's true that you don't see in the headlines any of these projects because news is always about bad things and very rare that they will focus uh, on the good things that are happening. There are many programs um, uh, that are taking place between the Jewish majority and the Palestinian minority inside Israel. There are other programs that are taking place between Palestinians and Israelis across the green line, especially in hospitals, uh, between doctors, um, the program, the, our program that takes place between um, uh, the Hebrew University, Sapir College, and the Najah University in West Bank. And these, these projects are also supported by the, uh, the Canadian um, um, uh, people here. But you always would say to me, oh, we know we need our money, we understand, but what is it that we can do beyond the money? It's not only supporting the programs. And here I wanna say something. I meet with many people, Jewish people in Canada, and sometimes I feel, and this is, part, this is, this is something that I experienced, that they hold a more narrow perspectives uh, when it comes to Palestine, Israel, than the, the Jewish Israelis in Israel. And they feel that they care about Israel and they, ha they, are, they, they, are, they, worry about, they are worried about Israel. And this is why they, they hold this narrow uh, point of views. There are many who are not like that, but I think um, in Canada, we need to create these groups between Palestinians and Jewish. And my house in the last seven years is a place that really become a place where many Jewish met with many Palestinians and many Jewish who never had the opportunity to meet with a refugee from Lebanon, finally met with a, a, a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon that for her, this was the first time that she met with a Jewish Israeli living in, 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 in Canada. At, the, at first it was very difficult for her to accept that, but when it became the normal of this kind of meetings, today it's, she is in a different place and not only she, many people that I get to bring together. So I really believe that if we create mirror groups here, groups who are taking action and bringing Palestinians and Israelis together, they absolutely can influence the discourse in Israel doing projects here in Canada, not only in Israel, because what we have here sometimes really influence. When people in Canada are not aware of the situation and they give money to a, a right-wing organization to do a project, this is putting an obstacle in front of us. This is not helping us. So for me, it's very important to educate the Jewish Canadians to understand that this is the message that we want them to support. The message that would sustain Palestine and would sustain Israel. War never survive. Only good neighbors can survive. Only relationship that based on respect and mutual understanding can survive. And we want that message also to be among the Jewish Canadian here in Canada and not only by supporting programs over there, but to work in the people here through the synagogues and through uni the universities and through other um, uh, venues. Okay. Well, we're, we're getting close to the end of the hour. It's gone very quickly and there, there are still many questions which I'm afraid we won't get to all. Um, I'm going to ask two, two that are related and then, um, and then uh, I'm afraid we'll have to ask uh, Brian to wrap it up. Um, so this is a, another anonymous question. It's, uh, it's 
how can Jews and Palestinians learn to forgive each other for previous wrongs done by each side? And a question by Jeffrey Wilkinson, which is a little more complex, but uh, um, and that is, um, how do you address the problem that for many Palestinians and supporters see Zionism and 1948 as the core of the problem? Um, and maybe, you know, we'll leave it with you <laughs> at that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, I really believe that both sides need to heal. Um, when every time a Palestinian presents his own pain or her own pain, and I have doing this with our ICANN fellows, immediately the answer of the Jewish side will be the Holocaust. And putting these two pains as competing will never help us. This should be a place where we understand and really feel the sympathy and, and open our hearts to understand the source of pain and not to put this as competing pain or hierarchical pain. Because pain is pain, whether you lost three brothers or one brother. Pain is pain whether you were kicked from your house in Haifa or kicked from your house in, uh, in, uh, in Poland. Pain is pain, and that's very much one of the obstacles in groups that work in coexistence. And uh, to, the, to that question that was about coexistence, I do have a problem with the term. And I think we should really put that term aside and work in how to create partnership and to create common grounds that we both share. We might not agree in 100%. I can tell you with my husband, who is raising with me and we are raising together our two kids, we might have only 70% in common, but we still able to live together and raise these amazing kids. So we don't need to agree on everything. And any project that brings Palestinians and Israelis to agree on everything is a project that is, is really called for fail. It's very important to look at what is it that we share and understand that both sides need to heal, that the pain is there for each one. And healing only will come through the personal stories and the personal encounters and the, the narratives that each side will, will tell. When people talk people, when people talk life, all of a sudden barriers are down. When people tell their stories as human, without labels, Jewish, Palestinian, they will be able to heal. And I'm not saying leave these labels. These are part of our identities and our identities are complex, but are important. But we really need to understand that both sides need to heal. And the post-traumatic syndrome that both are sharing is, is an illness. And we can't build on that illness. We have to get rid of that situation. We have to get beyond this trauma. We have to get beyond this situation. And this is only if we first, we start from an early generation, which is with our kids that they don't know prejudice. We teach them actually prejudice, right? And we work on the personal level and from the personal level to the communal level and from the communal level to a political level where we together change policies. But it has to come from a place where we feel that we really are there open to hear and to listen. And I see it from experience, it works. We had a fellow from that lost his brother in South Lebanon and we had another fellow who lost his brother in Syria. And today they are very close friends. When in the first meetings, both of them didn't wanna talk because each one blamed the other for his own suffering. And opening up and taking down these walls that will show me that the other side is a human being, is a mother or a sister, that really make the, the, the difference in the, in, the, in the story. Now, the 1948, 
yes, the 1948 is the core of the Palestinian problem. No, we can't put this aside, but we can't stuck there. We can't live the past as if it still with us. We can look at the past and learn from it. We can't change n narratives of the past. We can only learn from them, but we can look forward to weave the shared narrative for both of us. We can live, look forward to see what is it that we have in common that will enable us to weave this new narrative that would reflect my aspiration as Palestinian and the Jewish aspiration and will also respect the pain of both sides in a way that it's, you know, healing us and putting us in a step further with, with this issue. So when Palestinians are saying this is the core, I would suggest to the Jewish, don't fight it. When people say the Holocaust is the, is the, is the problem, I never thought to fight it. And I acknowledge it and I understand it. And I understand that people sometimes act from fear because they remember and they don't want to be back on that situation. And I expect from the Jewish people and the Jewish Israeli people to understand when Palestinians say that 48, that it's the Independence Day is the Nakba Day for the Palestinian. Accept that so you can move forward. Palestinians many times want only that recognition and that apology that until this moment, they never heard not from the leaders of Israel and not from the organizations in Israel. Uh, where we do have it, a good example here in Canada, where Canada recognized and apologized for the First Nation, we still don't have this. And, and as, long as, we, uh, as long as we don't have it, it will be very hard to move forward. So thank you. Um, Dr. Al Sana Al Juj, uh, for all, I'm going to have to end the question period, um, even though there are other questions. Uh, and um, so I'm going to hand it over to my colleague uh, uh, Brian to wrap up and make some closing remarks. And thank you from my my perspective. You are welcome. Amal, thank you very, very much for emphasizing the importance of integration, mutual recognition. And I'm going to thank you in um, a somewhat unusual way by relating an anecdote. On my last trip to Israel, I had the opportunity to have a discussion with a very intelligent, articulate Israeli journalist. I wondered how his strong nationalistic views impacted upon his understanding of Israel as a democracy. Believing that Israel will neither be fully realized as a democracy, nor will it fulfill its best attributes as a Jewish state until it has elected a Palestinian citizen of Israel as prime minister, I asked whether he would vote for such a person. He did not blink. He did not miss a beat. He said yes if they ran for Likud. Amal, I'm going to arrange for a Likud membership for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Then you're gonna challenge them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Now, before people sign off, there are just a couple of very quick things. Some donors are finding themselves conflicted when it comes to giving to organizations that support Israel. The realization that many that we have reflexively supported are silent on the occupation, complicit in population transfer, and supportive of settlements is discomforting. Please keep Canadian Friends of Peace Now easily reached at peacenowcanada.org in mind when allocating your donation funds. You will be enabling us to assist in pursuing a path towards a two-state solution. On behalf of the Board of Canadian Friends of Peace Now, Best wishes for a healthy and peaceful 5781. This evening will be available as the podcast on our website. Please spread the word. 
Thank you for attending. We look forward to further opportunities to engage. Thank you once again, Amal. Thank you to Gabriella and to Ruth, who has stitched this cyber tapestry together. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, and have a great evening.